Um, my name is Janet Hoy, and I am um, connected, of course, and a member of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. And I'm here actually with four of our associates, and I just want to do a really quick introduction for, of them. So Carol Morota, who is to my stage left, I guess, is uh, kind of my partner in crime on this Prop 15 stuff. And she is, in fact, the lead person for our local league on Prop 15. Um, Ann Flynn, who is on the other side, is the past president of the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. And she is helping us tonight kind of sort through the questions. I'll talk about how you can submit questions. We've already gotten a few, but we'd love to have your um, questions as we go along. So she's gonna be our question person. And then Paul Dirksen is the treasurer for our local league. And he is acting as our Zoom czar. So he's the one that's admitting everybody into the meeting, et cetera. So um, just wanna welcome everybody. Uh, I just wanna give you a quick pitch on the League of Women Voters. Carol will probably fill some of this in as well. Um, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. And I will also tell you in a minute that this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Um, and by nonpartisan, we mean we do not support or oppose candidates or parties ever. We never have, we don't now, we won't in the future. But we do take positions on issues. And we take positions on issues after very careful, sometimes torturously careful, study on issues, and then we take positions. And the reason we are all here is because the League has taken a position to support Prop 15. And we wanted to provide the opportunity for all of you to hear about Prop 15, to understand what it does and what it doesn't do, and to get a few different perspectives on Proposition 15 so you'd have a better way of analyzing it as we get closer to November 3rd and everyone's gonna be voting. So, uh, oh, and one more person. Um, you probably can't see her, but the president of our local league, Susan Riqua, I think she's here. I, I can't kind of tell at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to recognize her as being part of this as well, as well as, as, well as many other league folks. So two housekeeping things. Um, you have probably noticed that you are all muted and we will stay that way. Um, and also that there is, for most of you, not live video either. We did that so that people could really focus on the panelists, et cetera. Um, we do though invite you to, to ask us questions and we will do that. We've done that already. So we've gotten some questions into a, um, email box that we have been monitoring and Anne will use some of those as we kind of kick off the question period. But you are also invited to use the chat function and to ask a question as we're going along. We know that it can sometimes be really hard to wait for half an hour, 45 minutes to ask your question. So we certainly invite you to do that as we go along through the chat function. And for any of you who are new to Zoom, um, it might be a little different on everyone's computer but the chat function on many computers is in the bottom part of your Zoom screen and uh, kind of in the middle and it's a little kind of box and then it says chat underneath. And if you click on that, it will open up on the right hand side of your screen and you'll be able to ask questions. So we certainly invite you to do that. And then I think you heard, but we are um, recording this and we will be posting this two places. First to our YouTube channel, and then we will post it to our league website. And that website address is lwvdv.org. So it's League of Women Voters Diablo Valley.org, lwvdv.org. So I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. So welcome again. Um, so I wanted to quickly run through what we're gonna be doing and kind of what the agenda is. We were hoping to have Tony Thurmond, who is the state superintendent of public instruction but unfortunately, about an hour and a half ago, he had something come up and he is not able to join us. But we do have three great panelists who will be here to talk about Prop 15. Um, we have Harold Moon Goldberg, who is the um, president of the League of Women Voters of California. And she will provide kind of a foundational overview of Prop 15, what it does, what it doesn't do, et cetera. And I don't know if any of you have gotten your voter guide yet, but you, once you do, you might notice that Carol's name is in here in the rebuttal to the against and the, the, the opposed section. So Carol has been involved in Prop 15 for, gosh, a couple years now, Carol. First the first iteration, then the second one. So she will provide that for us. Um, then we will have uh, Contra Costa County Supervisor John Joya to talk about the 
Prop 15 and the impact on counties. This is all about the funding going to counties and schools. So John will be able to give us information on that. And then finally, we have a Contra Costa County Superintendent of Schools, Lynn Mackey, um, and she will be able to give us an overview of kind of the perspective from our local schools. So again, that's gonna be the order. And then after that, we will take both the questions we've gotten so far, as well as questions in chat. So please do feel free to enter stuff in chat. So I'm gonna introduce um, each of the panelists, and then we will have them talk for about 10 minutes or so. And then um, at the end of that, again, we will be doing questions. So I'll, I'll kick it off with Carol. So Carol Moon Goldberg, as I mentioned, is the current president of the League of Women Voters of California. And the League of Women Voters of California consists of 62 leagues, small leagues and large leagues, and over 5,000 members. Carol has been a member of the league for 25 years. She has served at both the local and state levels, and she served the voter service director for LWVC, California at the state, as well as as program director for the state in the reproductive choices area for three years prior to joining the state board. During that time, she represented the league in a coalition of organizations working on related issues, analyzed and followed legislation on the issue. She's a member of the Sacramento County League and she has spent many years serving in various positions on the board, including heading high school voter registration drives, which we're all involved in, and involvement with mock elections, coordinating the league's election day work with a local TV channel. Carol has made a career of volunteering after practicing law for a while, so she has a JD after her name. She served on the Sacramento County Grand Jury and on parent advisory committees to her local school board. Carol learned about nonprofit operations by volunteering on a variety of search and strategic planning committees. She is honored to follow in the footsteps of the far-seeing women who created the League of Women Voters a hundred years ago. Yay. And she's helping to empower voters and defend democracy today. So with that, I'll hand it off to Carol. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm very impressed with the number of people who are involved. This is great. Um, Janet brought up um, my volunteer work. Um, I, I can tell you for sure, if you're willing to work for free, you can always, always be busy. So um, if you're retired and worried you're gonna be bored, don't worry about it. Because if you're willing to work, they're willing to put you to work. Um, as Janet mentioned, the league is 100 years old and it was created by the same women who supported and fought for the women's right to vote or actually the women's right to exercise their right to vote. Um, they were so far seeing that they actually created the league six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified. That's how sure they were that they were actually going to win and prevail. So in addition to educating the brand new voters back in the 1920s, the league also realized that voters need to influence public policy through nonpartisan advocacy. As Janet said, the League is issue-oriented, not political party-oriented. And over the years, the League has developed principles and positions on issues that are the basis for our advocacy. One of those positions just happens to be on state and local finance, and it was actually first formed back in the 60s. It's been revised and added to a number of times since then. Um, but it essentially says the League of Women Voters supports measures to ensure revenues both sufficient and flexible enough to meet changing needs for state and local government services, and that contribute to a system of public finance that emphasizes equity and a fair sharing of the tax burden, as well as adequacy to meet the needs of the state and, and local governments. So if I can share my screen, we'll get started here. Uh, there we go. And let me do one more thing. I'm just so good at this stuff, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get to the presenting mode and my face is in the way, excuse me. Let me move me to the other side. All right, well, you're just gonna have to see my little one. There, <laughs> uh, let me try this. Never mind. so here we are. Yes on 15, I hope you all can see this. As I told you, um, here we are with yes on 15. 
In a report that was released in January 2020, the California Public Policy Institute concluded that California's economy was doing well. Uh, that included low unemployment rates, higher family incomes, and some improvements in all major industries. But the report also had something a little more ominous to say, and that was that even if all these good things continued, California's potential was limited by stubbornly high poverty rates, income inequality, high housing costs, and polarized job opportunities. One of the drivers of California's inequality is Prop 13, which passed in 1978. Property values then were soaring and that resulted in rising property taxes. And back then local entities imposed the property taxes and the effective property tax rate was about 2.6% of assessed value. Prop 13 created the system that we're operating under today. And it did two things. It froze property values in time and it set a fixed tax rate that applied all the way across the state. So property is now taxed at 1% of its assessed value. And the assessed value is the value that it was at the time it was first purchased. Now, until a property is sold or improved, there is no trigger that causes a reassessment for the entire property. Every, even improvements of the property or improvements to the property um, does trigger a reassessment, but only to the extent of the value of the improvement. And that is simply added on to the base assessed value. So the property as a whole is not reassessed until ownership of it changes. Now this helped homeowners stay in their homes, but the biggest winners were large com commercial and industrial property owners. There are large commercial properties that have retained their 1975 assessed values and or they have mass changes in ownership of the property through various corporate structures. The end result of this is that over the last 40 years, tax revenue per capita for cities and counties has fallen from $790 per person back in the late 70s to about $640 per person now. Today, homeowners account for a higher percentage of the overall property tax collections, um, higher than commercial property tax owner collections. And over the 40 years of disinvestment in our schools and communities, California has developed the most overcrowded classrooms in the US and some of the worst ratios of counselors, librarians, and nurses per student. We also have shortfalls in the funding for public hospitals, homeless services, affordable housing projects, um, everything that a city or county or special district can do. Needs are barely met, um, but not always great. Now, Prop 15 is going to help that. Um, it won't solve the whole thing, but it will help. Prop 15 will create a split role property tax. And by that, I mean that one role will be commercial and industrial property that is valued at over $3 million. The other role will be everything else, residential and agricultural property, commercial and industrial property worth less than 3 million is also in that category. Prop 15 will require that the largest commercial and industrial properties be reassessed to current market value about every three years. So there's no waiting around for a change in ownership to trigger some reassessment. Property 15, <laughs> not property, Prop 15 reclaims the tax rate of 1% of the assessed value for all properties. So that is not changed. And inflationary rates will still push it no more than 2% per year above that. And realize also under the current system, if there's deflation, there can be reduction in um, property taxes as well. And that will remain as it is now. So Prop 15, once it's finally in complete operation will reclaim about $12 billion per year for K through 12 schools, community colleges, and our local communities. Now that revenue um, is collected by the county. I'm sure you'll hear more about that later. And the revenue will be then divided roughly 40, 60, 40% 40 to public education, 60% to local government. Now of that 40%, 
K through 12 funding, so kindergarten through the end of high school, will receive about 89% of that figure. That's roughly $4 billion total when everything is implemented. Community college funding will be about 11%, um, roughly 500 million. Now, the public education portion will be sent to a dedicated education fund, essentially a bank account and that nobody, including the legislature, can touch. And that money is pooled from all the counties around the state. The money is then distributed using the local control funding formula, which is already in operation. And it's been used for a number of years in California to divide up other money to the various school districts and schools. Um, this money will be in addition to what they already get under the current funding programs. So it will not take away from the Prop 98 money. It will not take away from the property tax money that schools are already receiving. This is in surplus to that, in excess of that. The local control funding formula is an equation that allocates public education revenue to school districts um, based somewhat on average daily attendance and on need. And it's, um, it's used, as I said, across the state and has been for a number of years. Local districts, of course, decide how to spend their money. Um, and that's a process that usually involves school boards, administrators, teachers, people who work in schools, parents and students and other community groups coming together to determine how to allocate the funds. Under Prop 15, every school district will receive additional money and there are no limits on what they can use it for. They are the best people um, who know what the money is needed for. They're the ones who can set the priorities. Um, as I mentioned before, California has the worst ratio of student to school nurses, counselors, and librarians, and some of the largest class sizes in the country. Um, some estimate that California is 39th, others say 41st when it comes to per pupil spending. And that funding, as I said before, can be used for many things, including things like iPads and Chromebooks for students who are doing distance learning, of which we have many right now. The community college funding, as I said, 11% goes there and almost everybody lives near a community college. It is actually the largest higher education system in the world and has more than 3 million students in it. Um, students there not only prepare themselves to move on to four-year schools, if that's their wish, there are many, many um, training and credential programs um, that train people for the jobs that are needed in their communities. And approximately 70% of all nurses in California attend community college at some point during their educational career. So Prop 15 money will help boost them as well. A little bit about government funding, and there are people here who can explain it in much better detail than me, so I will just go quickly. Um, funding is divided between counties, cities, and special districts, and it's used for services like libraries, water, water districts, fire departments, parks and rec, uh, lighting and landscape, mosquito vector programs, fixing potholes, whatever. The division is up to the local governments themselves and the money is allocated to them to decide what and how to spend the money. All the revenue must be accounted for and publicly disclosed, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And I was actually supposed to show you this slide when I was talking about all that. So there you are, look at the kids at school. It's nice, isn't it? One thing I wanna be sure that you all understand is that Prop 15, does not change things for residential and agricultural property owners. Um, as I said, this is a split role. There's one role that's commercial and industrial property and a completely separate role that will be everything else. Um, and everything else will remain as it is. Property is only reassessed when it changes hands. It's only assessed at 1%. That's what the tax rate is. And um, all the usual rules are there. I need to explain a little more about residential property. And that is um, defined by use, not necessarily by zoning. So if a property is used for somebody to live in, it's covered. That includes large apartment buildings or small apartment buildings. That includes nursing homes and assisted living facilities. If a property is somewhat commercial, but also somewhat residential, um, the any assessment that changes will be only to the commercial section. So if it's a 50-50 building, 50% 50 will be residential and untouched and the other 50% would be reassessed under the terms of Prop 15. 
that's a common question. I didn't realize how frequently um, people live in that situation. It's interesting. Also realize that Prop 15 protects the agricultural land throughout the measure, both in intent and statute, agricultural and commercial agricultural property is exempt. So it will be treated the way it is now. Nothing will change. So remember when you're thinking about Prop 15, split role, commercial and industrial, one that is handled and reassessed about every three years, everything else is reassessed as it is now. Now, in addition um, to the fact that small businesses which own property that's worth less than $3 million will not be touched by this, um, there are also some changes to personal property tax, which in a business sense um, would be like business equipment. So um, if, if you're running a home-based office, you know, it would be your computer equipment and whatever you use. Um, if you're a mechanic working, um, it would be your tools and maybe your trucks and whatever else you need. Um, under Prop 15, business equipment that's um, worth up to $500,000 will be exempt from personal property tax. Um, that is um, for all businesses, not just anything we consider small, but all businesses. For certain small businesses, which both, well, actually three parts, they own their own property, they are based in California, and they have 50 or fewer full-time equivalent employees, they would be completely exempt from this business and fixtures um, equipment tax. So that will be a savings to them. Um, I'd like to remind you at this point, um, it is estimated that 92% of the revenue when this is all said and done will come from 10% of the top commercial properties, the largest commercial properties. Um, this proposition will not include small businesses that operate out of the house. Um, that will be considered residential because it is in a house and approximately 50% of small businesses in California are operated from the owner's house. So there's an exemption for them, they'll be treated as residential property, and then they will receive the business equipment tax break as well. And remember also, Prop 15 does not change the tax rate at all. It is still 1% of the assessed value of the property. That is not going to change. And um, I would remind you that 1% um, is quite low and um, New York and Texas have higher rates than we do. So one other thing that people are concerned about is accountability. As I mentioned before, let me click through here quickly if it'll let me. Now you see everything big. That's Dolores Huerta, founder and president of Dolores Huerta Foundation. She is a strong supporter of this. And um, this is Tara Lynn Gray, who is the president and CEO of the Fresno Metro Black Chamber of Commerce, also a supporter. Yay, there we are. I'm so glad you said this, Paul. So as I mentioned before, there is local control um, and we the voters have a part of that. Um, it's not just that the schools have to report what they're doing and the counties and cities and special districts need to make this information available. We the voters have a part in all of this. Um, this is a very league-like statement, so bear with me. We have a responsibility as voters to pay attention to who we are electing, to ask them searching questions, to understand what they stand for and what they plan to do. And then once they're in office, the voter's job is not done. The voter's job is then to continue to pay attention, to look for those disclosures, to go to public comment sessions, to write letters, to make phone calls, to do whatever you can to influence what is being decided. Um, this is your right. And uh, actually not just voters, high school students, residents of the city were all impacted by the decisions that are made at the local level. And so we all need to do it. And that means we all have a piece of local control within our own power. We don't always get what we want, but we have the ability to do that. At least make yourself heard. Now, Prop 15 in its terms also has some strict accountability rules, accountability rules. As I described before, all entities are required to publish and make available their information about what money they received and how they use it or how they plan to use it in a way that is both public and easily understandable to the public, not hidden away in spreadsheets somewhere. 
um, overall, there is a long implementation process for Prop 13. Let me go back here. Um, and that includes um, the creation of a property tax administration task force that is created under the terms of Prop 15. And it will be publicly convened, which means their meetings are open to the general public. Um, in this case, I guess, Zoom. Um, startup funding for the implementation will be transferred to the counties from the general fund. As revenues come in and are complete, then um, the general fund will be repaid. And the program, of course, the administrative costs, the county assessor's costs will be paid from the revenue generated as it is now. Um, the task force has two years to hash out all the details. Their job is to um, make recommendations about reg regulations um, that need to be passed, perhaps some legislation if necessary. They need to um, talk about the timing of the implementation process, which includes a phase-in period. They need to clarify the roles of the legislature, the Board of Equalization, other state agencies that are involved for enforcement and monitoring needs to um, assure itself that it has uniform guidelines for assessors, which the Board of Equalization is in charge of doing. Um, there are other issues, maybe modifying county auditor calculations, lots of technical things. Um, the task force is to be um, filled with people who are involved in the system. So a tax assessor, people from the Board of Equalization, a legislator, general public, um, everyone has a piece of it. The, um, as I said, the task force has two years to hash out the details, create an implementation plan. So um, don't think that if this passes on January 1, $12, million, $12 billion is going to show up. It's not going to be quite that quick. Um, the first likely date for any reassessments would be fiscal year 2022 through 2023. Um, the phase-in process will likely start with the largest, oldest properties first getting down to more smaller properties, probably not until 2025 and potentially beyond. Uh, as I said, it's a phase in, they have the ability and the duty to make a phase in that makes sense and that is adequate for use. So I wanted to do, whoops, get a look at all the people who are part of the Prop 15 coalition. Um, you will see in addition to the Teachers Association and SEIU, many other groups, including Pico, California, Faith in Action in the Bay Area, Power California, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, the Alliance for San Diego, Health Access, California Calls, um, a, a large variety of organizations that maybe you don't always see in a property tax um, proposition, but you're seeing in this one because we all feel strongly that schools and communities need the funding. They need a source of stable, more stable than sales tax um, revenue, and they need to be um, funded better than they are now. I think the pandemic has shown um, how close to the edge we've all been, particularly in terms of public health and a number of other things, and particularly in terms of schools. Um, they've done a heroic job of dealing with it now, but um, they need help. And this is a piece of setting California on a better path, a more stable path, that is supportive of our communities. Um, our communities are our families' homes. Um, you can't have healthy kids if you don't have healthy communities. If you don't have good services for them, and so this is a this is a bid for a future for them and for a more stable future. So remember, in short, Prop 15 split role commercial and industrial property will be reassessed about every three years. There is no change to the tax rate of 1% of the assessed property value. There is no change to the rules on the residential and agricultural property. There is a tax break for business equipment taxes and the system and the process should be and will be open and accountable. And for all those reasons, we hope that you will seriously consider and then vote yes on 15. Thank you so oh, much. We don't have any of these. Yes. So let me end this because Fabulous. we're not going to talk about this. Okay, cool. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker. It is Supervisor John Joya. Um, Supervisor Joya is a member of the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors. He was first elected in 1998, 22 years ago. John has been overwhelmingly reelected five times and represents 210,000 residents 
in the westernmost urban and diverse areas in the county. He previously served for 10 years on the East Bay Municipal Utility District Board, serving as presidents in 1995 and 1996. John is a recognized leader in Bay Area regional government and on air quality and climate change is issues. He was appointed by Governor Brown in 2013 to the California Air Resources Board and has served on the Bay Area Quality Management District Board since 2006, serving as chair in 2012. John has served as president of the California State Association of Counties and the California Cities, Counties, Schools Partnership. He has been a leader on environmental issues and serves on the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, the BCDC, and is vice chair of the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority, where he helped lead an effort to pass an, an historic mes measure to raise $500 million for San Francisco Bay. John is also co-chair of Rise Together, a regional effort to reduce poverty in the Bay Area. John grew up in Richmond, graduated from El Cerrito High School and the University of California, Berkeley with a BA in political science and also earned his JD degree at Cal Berkeley. He completed the program for senior executives in state and local government at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He practiced law until his election to the Board of Supervisors 22 years ago. John has successfully built coalitions to address issues such as affordable housing, homelessness, violence prevention, environmental justice, access to health care and public transportation, air and water quality, San Francisco Bay restoration, and expanding opportunities for youth. So with that, Supervisor Joy, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thanks uh, to the League of Women Voters for, for all the work you do, not just to holding this event. Um, you know that so many voters trust your analysis and your positions on issues. So this is just one in a series of all the great things you do. And I know how hard you work because the, the West County, League of Women Voters of West County, at least prior to COVID, met in my office in our conference room. And um, I know all the many discussions, uh, thoughtful discussions they've had. I come in and hear some of them. So um, uh, you, uh, the folks watching this can really um, appreciate that when the League of Women Voters takes a position, it is after pretty thorough analysis and discussion of all points of view. So I just want to acknowledge that. So I, I want to start off with just a little bit about um, local government, um, which is a very complicated maze and puzzle, but uh, I don't need to tell you that the services provided by local government are really the closest to our communities. And I think that is why this measure is called Schools and Communities First, because it is about um, getting more sustainable revenue, especially during these challenging times, to counties, cities, special districts, and schools. And, and I want to um, compare for a second um, who paid our tax, how property taxes were paid back when Prop 13 was passed in 1978 and who pays them today. And back in 1977, uh, here in Contra Costa, our tax base, which is our assessed value of properties, and today that amount is about $225 billion. So the assessed value in Contra Costa is $225 billion today. Back in 1977, residential properties accounted for a bit under 60% of that, about 57%. Commercial accounted for about 11%, agriculture about 2%, and industrial just about 30%, a little over 29. So if you fast forward to today, uh, residential properties now account for 80% of the assessed value and industrial properties only 8%. So that's due to a number of factors, but one of the significant factors is the effect of Prop 13. Think about that. Um, if you look at again, the pie of assessed value in Contra Costa, uh, the industrial properties were about 29% of that pie back when Prop 13 was passed and they're 8% today. Whereas residential properties went up about 20%. Um, and what that means is industrial properties pay a lot less um, of the total 
share of taxes, property taxes paid in Contra Costa. And one of the main factors contributing to that is that industrial properties don't turn over as frequently. And when they do, they're often done in ways of stock sales as opposed to property transfers, which essentially result in uh, the fact that these properties don't get reassessed uh, as much as residential properties that turn over quicker. So industrial properties pay a much smaller percent of the property taxes in Contra Costa today than they did back when Prop 13 was passed. Um, and that's not fair because had those properties been reassessed uh, in, um, under what's being proposed in Prop 15, they would pay more. And, and you've seen the, um, the estimate is that total property taxes collected in the state will go up by about $12 billion if this proposition passes with over 90% of that coming from just the highest 10% of industrial and commercial properties. And what does that mean for local government? Um, for, for county government, for example, and there have been estimates provided, um, in Contra Costa that would translate to about $85 million just to our county government. Um, and we, there's some estimates and I'll mention a few because I think it gives you an appreciation for what this means to local government. For those who are in the San Ramon Valley and pay taxes into the San Ramon Valley Fire District, um, Prop 15 would result in over $6 million of new revenue um, to the San Ramon Valley Fire District. Our own Contra Costa Fire District, frontline paramedics, first responders would receive over $24 million. Then cities like Richmond, for example, would get um, cities of, like Richmond, uh, I'll, I'll do a little comparison here uh, to give you a range, uh, would get about $20 million more. Um, Concord would get about $6 million more. It depends on the property tax base of, of each city. At the county, our revenue is a mix of federal, state, and local revenue except most of the revenue we get from the federal government and the state government is what we call categorical revenue for very specific programs. So when the federal government gives us money, for example, to run preschool Head Start, that's what we have to spend it on. Or when the state provides us funding to run a welfare to work program or for the CalFresh food stamp program, that's what we have to spend it on. But the most valuable money to local government is the discretionary flexible revenue we get through the property tax dollar. And then for those cities that have a sales tax, the sales tax dollars, if it's a general measure, we do not have a sales tax currently for county government. So for us, the property tax revenue that we get is especially important if we're trying to be responsive and respond, um, whether it's more innovative programs in health or social services. Um, unlike cities at the county, we do health and social services. Um, we have spent um, over $100 million between March and July in responding to the pandemic. While we hope most of that will get reimbursed from the federal government, um, you know, we've extended a fair amount of funding. Um, we've spent more money on homeless services, more money social services responding to needs, which continue and will continue beyond the pandemic. Um, so for county government, the money to us is really about improving the social safety net, improving health, frontline services, paramedics, ambulance service, things like that. Our own library system, for example, would get $5 million more uh, um, in revenue if Prop 15 passed. So we could increase library hours, expand libraries. Cities likewise will get increased revenue for their additional vital services. So it is really important to understand that this additional revenue is not coming from residential properties or agricultural properties or commercial properties of less than $3 million. It is coming from those larger properties that have been able to 
receive a tax advantage under Prop, under Prop 13. The, and the result of that, frankly, has been less vital services over the years. And you'll hear, I'm sure, from Lynn Mackey about the impacts on schools. And there's estimates as well. And I'll just say, because I'm from, I represent uh, the West Contra Costa School District, they will receive in the range of $20 million um, if Prop 15 passes. So think of that first number I talked about, which is that industrial properties went from about 30% of the tax base to about nine, to down around 8%. And then think about the value in terms of better services from the additional dollars that would be collected from, from those, from those uh, high value commercial and industrial properties. The other thing I think it's important to, to say is that, um, and I, I think it was mentioned at the outset, because I've talked to a number of small business groups, um, half of, according to the state, half of the small businesses in our state are run out of people's homes half. So that means the small, small businesses are being protected under this measure. Those that are in homes um, aren't getting an increase. And most small businesses, not all, but most are in commercial properties valued less than $3 million. And then in addition, they get um, a personal property, they get a personal property tax break, um, of up to 500, up to 500,000 of, of value of, of personal property. So in some cases, personal small businesses will actually end up paying less based on the personal property tax break. Um, we at, at the county have been addressing issues even well before the pandemic. For example, our health, our county hospital and 11 clinics, which provide important health care to nearly 200,000 residents in our county, that's a little under 20% of our county's residents, we've had to increase our general fund or local property tax contribution from about $20 million a year to $75 million a year, and that is going up. Most of the funding for the hospital and clinics comes from um, federal reimbursements, Medicare and Medicaid, but in order to keep the system sustainable because it's used across the board in the county. We've needed to increase the property tax dollars, as I say, from 20 to 75 million, and that continues to go up. So this measure ultimately is going to make it possible for local government to improve the quality of life, um, respond to basic services, and do it in a fair way. Um, when we get into questions, I do have numbers for how much estimates at least for what each um, city and special district in the county would receive under this measure. Um, so just think about what could be provided in your city with that extra funding. Thanks. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Supervisor Joya. So now we'll move on to Superintendent Lynn Mackey. Uh, Lynn Mackey was elected as the Contra Costa County Superintendent of Schools in November 2018. Prior to the election, Lynn was the Contra Costa County um, Superintendent of um, Education, uh, Deputy Superintendent, where she also directed the agency's Educational Services Department. She's a seasoned teacher and administrator with over 20 years of experience working directly with the county superintendent at the Contra Costa County Office of Education. And I thought I'd add in just a little bit here to talk about exactly what her job is. So the county superintendent of schools is elected by the voters of the county and is the chief executive officer of the Contra, Contra, Contra Costa County Office of Education. She administers all county office of education programs and facilities, cooperation among schools, colleges, universities, government and community organizations. She's responsible for monitoring and approving all school district budgets, big job. In addition, she serves as the advocate for education with the legislature and the public, so quite a liaison role. So with that, Superintendent Mackey, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Janet, and uh, thank you, John, for that information on the county, and thank you so much, Carol, for 
that background and solid information about um, COP15. I've been, I was talking to um, the group prior to the presentation and saying how concerned I was that I've been informed and I've been out in a, well, virtually out and about, I should say, and um, people aren't talking about Prop 15 in a way that I keep bringing it up, I keep talking about it. You know, people are talking about schools and what schools aren't being able to provide right now. But what we really need to talk about is how we can better, more adequately fund uh, education. So thank you for that kind of statewide level and countywide level. And I'll talk some about our, our 18 school districts and how we, even prior to COVID-19, we are woefully um, inadequately funded. Um, our districts, our average uh, revenue is about a little over 12,000 per student. And I know to the you know, to the layman that might seem like a lot of money, but it is is—it is not. As our revenues have stayed flat over the years, first gone down, right? We went from the, you know, kind of the heyday of education in the 70s, right before Prop 13, right? Before Prop 13, when, where we were um, number seven nationally, our state was number seven nationally in spending for education, to now, as you heard Carol mention, we are, at, very much at the bottom in funding in education um, nationally, depending on what study you see, it's anywhere from the high 30s to the low uh, 40s. And then in services to students and class size and counseling and library services, really at the bottom um, in California. And we're the fifth largest economy and I mean, sometimes, and I'm so glad, I was so glad that Carol covered so much of the facts because I just feel like I want to get into the um, passion and the need because we need to prioritize children and youth in our state. They should be our highest priority and by not adequately funding uh, schools, we just show that we are not prioritizing children and youth and young people in, in California. And it is just, um, paramount that we, we start making uh, efforts and making headways in this. So some of the areas, you know, in the 70s, we were doing okay uh, financially, Prop 13 happened. Since then, we have just uh, cut and cut and cut. And then when we hit the recession, just um, 2008, we hit a recession that even devastated education more and we we were starting to climb out of that we we reformulated our our funding model uh, jerry brown reformulated the funding model and he did focus on sort of a higher priority students um, which was wonderful i am so for funding the uh, lcff model where and supplemental concentration dollars dollars where we fund students who are higher need with higher do dollars that is so critical but at the same time, we have school districts, if they didn't have a um, high proportion of students in need, their dollars were flat. So as their um, expenditures rise every year, step and column rises every year, we want to more adequately fund, uh, pay our teachers and our staff, and we are really still low in that area. Um, so as pension costs rise, as building costs rise, as just all your basic services rose, our funding stayed flat. So here we go into this this pandemic, this crisis, and we have overcrowded classrooms. We don't have all the essential uh, services that a school just in a regular time needs. Um, adequate mental health funding in all schools, adequate nursing funding in all schools. We don't have that. And then we go into this pandemic where, um, you know, Right now, as we move, when we're starting to talk about reopening schools in some phase, and the, one of the first phases would be to have maybe half a class back. In other places, this is, is possibly going to work, but we have some districts that are so overcrowded that that's, even that's impossible. So when we get the green light to go ahead and open, some of those districts are really going to struggle because they don't have, they have too big of class sizes even to do a hybrid model. So 
um, it's just it's just critical that we start prioritizing our children and our young people by adequately funding education. Um, so some of the areas this this as both John and Carol mentioned, this won't be categorical funding. This won't be funding or grant funding that is de just designated for one purpose. Local school boards, local education agencies will be able to determine where these funds will get spent and then they'll be held accountable and um, need to make it transparent how these funds are spent. Um, locally, just to give you, and when we come to questions and answer, I, I too have what all our districts, the projections on what our districts will be getting. Um, but just some, some highlights for Mount Diablo, that there's a low base than a higher base. Let's say Mount Diablo Unified could get anywhere from 10 million to a little over 18 million. Uh, West Contra, the lowest would be around 10 million and the high is nearly 20 million. Um, smaller districts, John Sweat, you know, just very, very small districts, they'll benefit on the low end between 500,000 up to almost a million dollars. And this is just so critical. And I just passionately want everybody on this call to get, just get out the vote and tell everybody you know to um, please vote yes for this. Vote yes to an investment in our young people and our children in our county and in our state. So I look forward to the questions and answers and hope, um, hope we do get out the vote and make this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you for, for providing such a good first foundation and then county perspective and school perspective that is added immensely. So um, chat is open. Please put your questions in there and I will turn it over to Ann Flynn who will head up our question and answer period. Thank you very much, uh, Janet, and uh, thank you for uh, for all that good information, uh, panel. That that was um, uh, valuable. So our first question uh, comes in from Ashley, and we'll talk. We'll ask John to answer this one first. She says, "What will be the effect of Prop 15 on rents at shopping centers? Will small businesses' rents go up, which uh, they will then pass on to their customers?" Um, of course, that will depend upon the value of the property, right? If if prop if commercial property is valued at over three million dollars, there will be um, increases in valuation over time. Um, again, these will be phased in. Larger properties are going to get assessed first, so there will be a phase-in period for for properties. So. It, so it depends really on the value of the of the property. If the again, if the property is over three million, um, ultimately then there will be some increases. Ultimately, um, how much is passed on to a tenant will also depend upon the terms of the lease. Uh, some leases uh, will allow the landlord to pass that on to tenants. Uh, others will not. So what does it mean if the rents go up uh, in in <coughs> Uh, I will say, right, every measure uh, will have uh, those who will pay more. So the question I think to ask ourselves is, what will the, however, be the benefit of the increased revenue to a community? Um, and by providing better services in a community, um, you're also improving the quality of life in that community. You're, you're improving the economy of that community. So you're having many positive effects. I think we need to, we need to be honest. There will, there will be um, some increases, but again, what, what you heard was that 90% of this revenue comes from the top 10% of properties. So I, I would look at the broad perspective of the benefits that this measure will have in a community um, compared to the small number of properties statewide that will see increases. And of course, in the example of a shopping center, um, depending when that shopping center was built, if it was a newer shopping center with more recent valuations, you may not be seeing an increase. So it, you really have to look at it case by case. Thank you very much. Uh, the okay, next- May I add one thing to that? 
Oh, yes, please. Yes. If there, okay. any of you have uh, things to add, please, please do. Thank you. Okay, I, I actually kind of have two things to add to it. Uh, remember, it, the tax rate is 1% of assessed value. Um, so that, that changes the look of the figure. It also remember that um, business owners will re be able to exempt up to $500,000 of their business equipment from property tax as well. Yeah. So, um, so that will have an impact on them as well. Correct. Right. Okay, great. Um, next question is uh, maybe Carol, you could uh, carry on with this one. Um, Barbara asks, what if a commercial property sits vacant and has no tenants or no income? Um, I'm not quite sure where that's going. Um, if they're, if it's worth less than $3 million, nothing will happen. Um, if it's worth more than $3 million, then potentially the tax rate will go up and potentially um, the, the person who owns it may decide maybe I should um, do something with this, find a way to fill it or um, I, I turn it into, I'll turn this over to our supervisor, turn it into some sort of homeless shelter or affordable housing or something. Maybe, maybe there can be an alternate use of it somehow. This might be yeah. a little incentive to think about that. And, and, and let me say, you know, and properties are, are commercial properties, industrial properties are valued uh, in one of, uh, of, of a couple of ways. One are right is our, our comparable sales and market value. Another is sort of the income method. A perfect example, the oil refineries in our county, there was one that was recently sold, but that happens very rarely. Their value is based on their revenue, the income they produce. So likewise, an, an owner, if a commercial property like a shopping center is sitting vacant and they're not renting it, that property owner is most likely going to look at where do they guess get the lowest property tax, and if they've been using the income method uh, to value their property, there that that will affect their value, and they'll have a lower value because they're not getting income from their property. Um, so I think that's another thing to remember that a that a vacant property um, that may be valued under the income method. Um, is not is more likely going to see a decrease because their value is tied to the income that they receive from the from the property. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, now, Bob asks, um, what is the likelihood that uh, larger corporations will leave the state if Prop Fifteen passes? Uh, John, you want to? Yeah, that? you know, I we hear this all the time. So I serve on the California Air Resources Board. And back, you know, when this state started its, um, uh, its climate change program, there were all sorts of predictions that, gee, all, that, that the cost of, of fighting climate change and the regulation on industry to make our air cleaner is going to result in businesses leaving our state. Well, guess what? The op actually, that didn't happen that California has seen some of the strongest economic growth, of course, talking prior to COVID, which, we've, which has affected everybody globally. California has had the more robust economy as a state than many states in this country that have, have hardly any regulation and have lower taxes. It's because of the desirability of the workforce, the environment, the economic condition, the innovation and, and state policies to encourage that. So I, I always take these, the, the fear that's thrown out with a grain of salt. If you look at the history of economic growth in this state, which has grown to be, what are we now? The fifth largest, we were sixth, fifth largest economy in the world. Um, and it's been despite um, the, yes, the more rigorous regulations we have over business, especially on air quality and, so, and um, as well as varying tax rates. So I think, again, we need to step back and sort of look at the history of the state, look at where we are in the underfunding of schools. I think Lynn talked about the importance of funding schools. Our state is stronger when we have stronger schools and we're turning out more young people, preparing them for jobs, for workforce. So um, the benefits are much greater. Okay, thank you. Carol, would you like to add anything to that? 
Uh, no, actually, I think that's been covered quite well. Um, and um, it, we do hear job killer bills, you know, we always hear that for almost everything. Um, I really don't see Chevron and Shell picking up and leaving their refineries behind or I, or IBM or, you know, the large Silicon Valley um, companies. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, John, this follow. This is a question I think that followed along with your presentation from Marielle. Um, what is the percent of re residential properties in the 1970s versus commercial and industrial properties? If you could expand on that a little. Sure. I think there's been a tremendous- Hi, growth. Marielle, I saw, I did see Marielle on, on here. I did see it. So good. yes, good, good question. So actually, I, I actually have those numbers. Um, and yes, there has been prop, there has been residential growth uh, in this in the county. But if you look at uh, and I'll I'll pull it out. If you look at parcels uh, back in nineteen, um, I have the parcel counts uh, for those years. Uh, I'll pull it out. So um, back in um, uh, back in nineteen nineteen seventy eight. Um, Residential uh, parcels accounted for uh, about 91% of the parcels in the county. Industrial accounted for about 1%. Well, guess what? It's about the same. Industrial properties today account for about 1%. Residential parcels account for about 94%. So essentially, the mix of residential parcels back in 1978 and today went from 91 to 94% and the industrial parcels went from, uh, uh, again, stayed in the range of 1%. So I, I, I think that what that tells you is that, again, the assessed value of industrial properties has gone down for, again, for many reasons. I'm not saying prop, prop 13 was the only reason, but if you look at other studies about who pays taxes, it is clear um, that industrial properties and large commercial properties pay a smaller percent of the total property tax pie in Contra Costa County than they once did. I mean, Contra Costa County is still the second most industrialized county in the state after Los Angeles. Okay, thank you. Um, now we've gotten a number of questions about uh, negative um, comments about Prop 15 on uh, television, for example, there are commercials which actually lie or distort the truth. Um, for example, it will hurt small business or um, uh, it will raise residential property taxes. What can we do to combat mis misinformation so Supervisor Joya, you've been in politics a long time. What do you do? <laughs> you know, I have found unfortunately that even when you try to combat misinformation with accurate and good information, it's helpful, but it doesn't always have immense impact. People make their right, make their voting decisions often based on you know, emotionally how they feel about something as opposed to maybe thinking through all of those issues. So I think while it's always important to correct misinformation that's out there, it is really just as important, if not more important, to focus on the benefits. And you, and I think uh, our, our superintendent of schools talked um, eloquently about what it means for our students. We can talk about it in terms of what it means for better health care better paramedic services, let me, t and tell stories. And here's a story I will tell. Um, my father died of cardiac arrest at age 58 because he had ventricular fibrillation. And folks know that that is the classic type of cardiac arrest that if you are revived within those first few minutes, you will likely live. But with him, um, and I'm using this as an example of why response time is important and, and why these services are important. Because by the time he was revived, um, he had suffered significant brain damage. 
Um, he, revi he was revived, he was alive, but he died. He was in a coma for 10 days and died. I think when people understand what better services mean in real life terms, they relate to that. Uh, this, we can throw out all the numbers in the world, um, but I think making the, the making the um, um, the the value of, of a measure real in terms of people's lives, and all of you will have your own stories. Whether it's how do we get better mental health services? You know, in Contra Costa, there's been a lot of discussion by many people and cities after the death of Miles Hall in Walnut Creek, um, uh, not, you know, not that long ago, about the importance of having mental health response along with a law enforcement response, and that that would have saved a life, potentially. I think it's those examples and those stories, or the fact that we used, and, and, and several of you have talked about this, the most valuable money to local government and schools is flexible, non-categorical discretionary dollars. Because then we can spend it where it is most effective and often in an innovative ways because so much of the money we get, especially at the county level, is federal state dollars that say, here's how you have to spend it. But when you have the choice locally of deciding where to spend it, whether it's a new mental health program, more paramedic services, better fire in East County. You know, and here's what Prop 13 did wrong as well. In East Contra Costa County, in that fire district, the, pub, the, the fire district gets eight cents of the tax dollar. The Contra Costa Consolidated Fire District gets 16 cents of the tax dollar, which is more average for fire districts. No fault of the residents, but they're suffering with closed fire stations and less fire response times in an era of wildfire and higher fire risk because of an anomaly when Prop 13 came into effect and these rates got locked in. This extra revenue will provide funding for districts like that. In fact, East Contra Costa Fire, I think I cited, uh, will, will end up with uh, additional revenue um, to, in fact, uh, to be able to help make up for that unfair treatment they, they, they received. Thank you. So that's Carol. how I would respond to misinformation. <laughs> Thank you. Carol, do you have a misinformation uh, golden word? Um, I, I agree. Um, it, it's good to say something like, oh, they always say that. It's just a scare tactic. But that's just the start. It's better to follow it up with a story. Um, my story would be that my oldest child uh, graduated from high school in 2011. So the community college district was severely constricted because of the recession. And um, she uh, was on huge long wait lists for the general ed classes that she needed um, because her goal was, and, and she did do it, um, to transfer to a four-year school. But uh, she was told by her counselors, if you are number 20 or less on the wait list, go to class. Um, keep going to class until they tell you not to come because maybe somebody will drop out and you'll be able to go in and take their place. Um, I, I just thought that was stunning um, that they, they did not have classes available for the students who needed them. They did not have basic classes available. Um, it, you know, it took her two semesters longer to finish the community college, her AA degree, um, because of that, because she would Sometimes it worked. Um, she was number 18 one time and she managed to get into a psychology class, but um, it, it, I was just really stunned. And then I realized so many students had gone to community colleges because they couldn't afford the four-year schools. And then those classes were so impacted that um, they couldn't pursue their education. I don't wanna see that happen again. Yeah. And I'm afraid it will. Uh, Lynn, you're, you're an elected official. Do you have a, an a, a idea of what to do about misinformation? Need to turn on your mic. Hey, there we go. Yay. It was, it was uh, giving me a bad time. I just, you know, just like John and Carol said, by stories, by actually talking about facts, you know, having the facts, there's a really good... Um, uh, Prop 15 facts, FAQ, you know, if you can Google it and it just has some nice clear facts. Uh, the information on Carol's presentation, that will be a public document, I'm assuming, because this is 
uh, broadcasted. That has just some really good clear information because people do have uh, misinformation about Prop 15. They really do. Um, you, know, you know, I've heard people say that they thought that their, their, their regular residential property tax was going to be raised and there's all this misinformation about how it's gonna go to schools. So I think really just having those facts and then just like when you get out the vote, just all these people in this room, they need to talk about it and they need to clear it up with their friends and neighbors and get their friends and neighbors to know the facts and just one person at a time, keep talking about it. Thank you. Well, I've got you. Um, there's a concern about pension shortfalls in, uh, in all of government uh, employees. Um, what would what if school districts just use the funds to uh, uh, fill in their pension shortfalls? What what can be done to avoid that? You have to you you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Oops. Let me see. I'm not sure I can do that. No. It's it was saying the host was not allowing me to unmute. Oh. So maybe I should just keep it on um, um, unmute. So what, you know, how people will spend this money it will be a local decision, which I think is really important to not have it be restricted dollars or not have it categorical. If a school district, if, you know, pensions are part of their um, budget, it will, you know, I can guarantee just knowing my 18 school district budgets, it won't be just going to backfill pensions. But it is really, I believe in local control. I believe in that elected school board making that decision with their community. And they'll be able to determine how to best spend this money. And then they will make it transparent to the community. And that is how the money will be spent. Okay, thank and you. And let me say, you know, you know, when we hear this a lot where I think people are picking and choosing now what they think are the most negative arguments. So in Contra Costa County, our county government has the highest credit rating possible for local government. We have a AAA credit rating. It's because we've prudently managed our financial resources uh, in a responsible way, even though uh, we don't have a local sales tax, which we have on the ballot this November. And even though our property tax base is um, less robust than in neighboring counties like Alameda and, Contra and uh, Santa Clara and San Mateo and San Francisco or Marin, for example. Um, so look, um, we, we have managed, um, we have managed our, our, our finances in county government responsibly. Um, and part of it is because we've had to make cuts. Um, when revenue has gone down, um, effects of property of Prop 13, when we've had, we've had to make cuts and we've been responsible. I think it is time for us to um, bring back um, the types of services that will make our community more vibrant. Um, look, I grew up in this school district. My father was a, a teacher in the school district. My kids go to this school district, three generations of our family. Um, there, there have been immense challenges in, in our schools. In fact, if, you, if, you're, if you're a residential property owner, the biggest thing that affects the value, one of the most largest factors that affects the value of your property is the quality of your schools. So if you're a residential property owner, um, even if you don't have kids in the schools, your community overall is better, our workforce is better, and your property value is better when you have stronger, higher quality schools. Thank you. Um, now, this, this is a unique question, um, and I don't know whether um, our panel has the, uh, the uh, information to, uh, to ask it, but wineries are an interesting question, particularly in our county. Um, what if it's a winery that has a, a vineyard, so it's agricultural land, has a winery, which is a manufacturing and piece, and then it has a, a tasting room, which is retail. So how, how is that categorized and it, does that come under the, uh, the increase? question. I'm if pulling out to... some of the notes I have and obviously every property is going to be looked at uniquely mm -hmm. but my, underst my understanding is that that production uh, uh, value-added added production 
of agriculture located on the agricultural property is treated as agricultural property. So, so a winery, which is clearly a production, which is at the vineyard um, and, and, and clearly uh, turns grape into wine, is a production facility and, and is considered an agricultural use. Uh, I've had some discussions uh, with, um, with others who are looking at this issue because that was an issue um, that we heard. I, you know, when we had a lot of discussion uh, about this measure uh, at the California State Associ Association of Counties. And we're talking to county supervisors from the Central Valley who asked this question about what does it mean for agriculture in the Valley when there's production on the site. So um, clearly, if, if in the old days, Emeryville used to have a lot of canneries, now it's shopping centers, right? So an example is product that was sent from the Central Valley to a cannery in Emeryville, that's considered an industrial property. But a production at the uh, agricultural property, like a winery, um, uh, makes it, uh, it's determined under the rules as agricultural property. Okay, thank you very much. That was unique. Um, so that really, uh, there, there are more, um, we've combined a number of questions. So there are other uh, takes on, uh, on the issues, but I think we've covered all of the uh, categories of questions that have come in. I don't know whether you want to do uh, summaries, uh, Janet, um, should I throw it back to you? Do you want to take on uh, doing, having everybody make a summary or? Not. Well, yeah, I guess I would ask our panelists, would, would any or all of you just like to do some concluding remarks? I think it's been a really um, robust conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to um, be here tonight and to answer all of the questions that we've had. Um, and I just wonder if you would like to, you're welcome to take just a minute or two and do some concluding remarks. I'll go. Um... This is very important. Education is very important. The fact that we have underfunded our schools in California for so long and have got them into the position that they are in right now is um, untenable. And we need to start working on strategies for funding our schools. And this is a very fair strategy. And please get out the vote. Let's take care of our young people in California. I, I would just say um, to sort of, sit for a second and think about the vision that you want for your community. You, you, you want cleaner streets and better roads and better ambulance response time um, and you know better housing, um, getting our homeless neighbors off the street and in, into, into housing that they deserve. If, if you want a community that encompasses all of that, then additional revenue by fairly taxing properties across the state will help us fund those things. And, and I'll say, we've been, for example, we've been trying for years wanting to deal with housing, address housing for homeless families. When the state opened up their program of Project um, Room Key and Project Home Key, um, we had a new source of revenue and we leased hotel rooms to get homeless individuals off the street. And we used the funding to actually buy mot a Motel 6 in Pittsburgh to be permanent housing, to get homeless individuals off the street. All that takes money. And yes, hold your local officials accountable on how they're gonna spend it, elect the right pe people to office, but don't say, I don't wanna fund these things because I don't like the council members in my city. We'll go out and do something about it and change it and get them to reflect your values and invest in the things that are important. But we can only be as effective as the resources we have spent a, a properly and with accountability. You should have been last. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just summarize quickly so people remember Prop 15 is about when property is assessed, specifically when commercial and industrial property is assessed. Um, there is no change to the tax rate. There will be no change to residential and agricultural property. Um, there is a tax break for businesses on their business equipment tax. I think people need to think about and perhaps um, 
in the recent times we have come to understand how much policy and how much work is done at the local level, whether it's education, whether it's dealing with homelessness, general public health issues, climate change issues, the decisions and the implementation many times fall on our cities and our counties and our special districts. And they can't do the work we want them to do if they are not funded, if they don't have predictable, stable funding, um, it makes everything more difficult and we won't have the quality of life that we need. So please vote yes on Prop 15. That's a good close. That's a great close. Thanks again to all three of you. I think it is so important that we as voters um, understand the options we have in front of us, understand on a kind of a really a personal level for those of us who are here in Contra Costa County, what this will really mean to us. And if it doesn't pass, what could happen and how things could get worse. So that was a, a really personal way, I think, to present it for all three of you. I thank you very much for doing that. Um, the election you all know is coming up. You may not have got it, but just today I got my um, voter information guide. If you want information on Prop 15 and all the other propositions, the League of Women Voters has votersedge.org. It is a nonpartisan evaluation and review of candidates speaking in their own words, answering questions, the propositions, pros and cons. It is um, prevents both sides and also provides information on the financing behind candidates and propositions, which is an important element we sometimes don't really talk about a lot. So votersedge.org, um, we are happy to engage on other issues. We really appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, happy voting and yes on Prop 15. Thank you all so much. <laughs>